Welcome to Spotlight On, where we examine the technology shaping our world through conversations with the people building it. I'm your host, Arun Matthew, and I'm here with Vlad Magdalen, CEO and founder of Webflow. Great to have you. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Why don't you give us a little bit of an overview on what Webflow is? Uh, so Webflow is a platform that lets people build really professional websites, um, code-grade production CMS-driven websites that typically would be built by a developer. We're a visual way to build really, really powerful websites. When I think about Webflow, I obviously think of our personal relationship and our friendship, but your origin, I think it's really important to understand your history and background. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of your personal history and what led you to start Webflow. So I uh, was born in the USSR, uh, grew up in a very tiny village. And when I was nine, my family was lucky enough to immigrate here as refugees. And long story short, I, uh, I wanted to pursue something creative, but my brother went to study computer science uh, at Cal Poly. And I was, you know, my parents were like, he's already going there. We can only afford to take our kids to one place. Uh, we can't, you know, drive you to different places. So I went there and uh, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Um, so I dropped out after nine months and moved up here to San Francisco to uh, to go to the Academy of Art. The thinking being, hey, I love this creative stuff. Um, I, I really enjoyed graphic design. And this is when Pixar was really taking off. They had a couple movies under their belt and that was like the dream job. It was like a really awesome uh, experience seeing the power of 3D animation software and 3D modeling software, how far it came. Then when I decided to leave the art school and go back to Cal Poly to study computer science, because it uh, sort of felt like a more rational career path, um, I ended up at this web design agency. And I was essentially an intern that got Photoshop files from the design team and had to translate them to the CMS um, that this like in-house team built uh, for, for their clients. And immediately, like, I had this aha moment around uh, why why the hell does this translation layer exist when I just came from like uh, this powerful 3D animation software where there's no translation layer. It's just like a person who's creative, has an idea, uses the software, presses a button, it goes to the render farm, ends up on the movie screen, right? I mean, I'm sure there are interstitial steps, but not from like what you imagine to it ending up in the real world. Um, and that's where the um, like all of these things came together, computer science, graphic design, 3D animation, um, and just saw this massive gap in the world. So 2012, you started the business. What I think is really interesting is that um, you started the business, you went through YC, mm -hmm. and that was its own experience, and it seemed like it was a really positive development yep. for the company, and you raised a seed round. Yep. And then you went six or seven years without raising capital, which is a very... Not un for lack of trying initially. A very unusual yep. thing. And so take us through a little bit of that journey mm -hmm. where you were searching for product market fit. You found it at one point, mm -hmm. but you intentionally or non-intentionally didn't raise capital, which forced some level of constraint on the business. Yep. Yep. And so that period of time, take us through what was going on in that period. We were going to go down the traditional path, right? Like we saw all of these high-flying YC startups. And the story in our heads was like, you get into YC, the rest is easy. It was two months after demo day and we had only raised, we had targeted to raise uh, just a little over a million dollars, but we raised 350. Um, and we were just so demotivated. I think we had uh, over 100 investor meetings. Most were either no's or ghosted, like they just didn't tell us anything. So we just didn't know what the what the situation was. We went back and we had like office hours with Paul Graham from, from YC, and he saw how dejected we were. And he's like, look, there's three of you, you have enough to um, to at least operate for a year. Like your users are already screaming at you because the product's not improving. You're, all you're doing is trying to raise money for the last you know two months. Um, so it was like this, we felt kind of trapped. Uh, and he was like, look, just say you're done um, and tell all investors that you're done and you have enough to support yourselves for a year. And like, just focus on building something awesome, make something that people want and you'll figure it out later. Uh, that was actually the best advice possible because the second we did that and told a bunch of like, told, like emailed all the investors who, um, uh, who had been, you know, quiet or weren't sure or whatever, all of a sudden 
they were like, oh, wait a second, we're, you know, uh, now that there's, I guess, some time pressure, right? we really seemed like we we're genuine around like, hey, we're not raising anymore because we genuinely did not believe we could raise more. Mm. Uh, but that thankfully manifested in um, just a little bit over, like more checks came in because of that time pressure. And thankfully we kind of closed out that seed round. Uh, but then um, th then we assumed that, you know, we we're gonna raise a series A, just like uh, every other startup. Uh, so we started building towards that, hired a bunch of people, started building uh, what eventually became our CMS. Um, and, uh, but we were like hiring way faster than revenue was growing. Um, and at one point I was looking at, uh, you know, the spreadsheet where it's sort of like the trend of where cash is going to be uh, six months from now. And it was not great. We were still not growing fast enough to, um, to justify anything like a Series A. Um, in some conversations that we tried, it was it was kind of like a very quick, like, hey, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. um, this is like a, you should be able to get further on your seed round um, and then, then come back. Um, so I felt it was like really existential. So we essentially just said, look, we're going to stop hiring. We're going to um, focus everything possible to get to something, to a product that we can monetize better and sell to more people. Um, and the goal became break even, like, somehow get to be in control of our own destiny. So we hit that uh, almost out of necessity because we felt that otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to raise more money. Um, and that was actually like a really liberating feeling. It was a, what I thought was like a way to survive to then raise more money ended up being like, hey, why do we need to raise more money? Like, would, uh, you know, there's... You were sort of forced into this position, but then it gave you freedom. Are you grateful for that period? Do you feel like you learned something? And if you had to do it again, mm -hmm. I know you're forced into that yeah, position, yeah, yeah. but if you were to do it again, would you have bootstrapped through that period again? Would you have raised if you could have? In hindsight, I think knowing what I know now, um, A, yeah, we, did, we learned a ton through that, right? But I think we spent too long thinking of that as a constraint. Mm -hmm. Like I think we could have done a lot more sooner to expand not only to grow our customer base, but like build more of our product. Um, I think in hindsight, it was a great experience to, to, to teach the company this like value of not just frugality, but like, you know, revenue is uh, a, like the way that you reflect the customer value right. um, is by building something that people are willing to pay for. Uh, and it just, it, engenders a lot of um, um, more rational thinking around like the healthy mix of growth versus, um, you know, spending um, versus how, you know, how you're, how quickly you're bringing value to customers, et cetera. I think in hindsight, if I had like a magic wand, I think um, I can see a lot of potential upside and like acceleration if we had raised our series A instead of in 2019, maybe around like 2016 mm -hmm. or something like that, where we already had that value um, of running lean and efficiently kind of engendered throughout the company, not just the founding team, but the leaders. Um, uh, but I think we constrained ourselves for too long mm -hmm. uh, to growing as fast as our revenue was growing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and had we, had we had more capital earlier, I think it would have given us, uh, it, uh, you and I have used this phrase a lot, courage capital. It would have given us the courage that, um, you know, to take bigger bigger bets sooner. Yeah. And that was like a time in the market that um, we were just running away with, um, with innovation compared to, you know, Adobe had three different products in mm -hmm. the space that they slowly shut down uh, because we were doing so well. So I think that could have um, like really accelerated our adoption in the market um, mm -hmm. that then would have been even more compounded by, you know, the, the years of growth that we've seen since. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we met a few years later mm -hmm. and um, it, it seemed like a really opportune time, both in terms of the market, the maturity of the business and the product. And we got really excited about the potential. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious from your perspective, how did you view that after so long, after six or seven years of sort mm -hmm. of bootstrapping, yep. how did you go through the thought process of thinking about raising capital mm -hmm. and from who? Yep. And um, 
level setting expectations around who the right investor for the business, especially given your core values and mm -hmm. how you wanted to run the company and your long term vision for it? Well, first, we had somewhat of a shaky relationship with some investors mm. um, uh, where, you know, it really did from from our seed round feel like there were some folks who wanted to take us in a different direction than, than what our vision was, right? So there was a little bit of like skittishness around, Oof, like if, if and, and that was just the seed round, right? Like no board seat, uh, uh, it was essentially just social. Um, kind of social pressure or social expectations. Um, so I had some skepticism around, hey, at bigger scale, at larger check sizes, this only multiplies, right? And and I had a lot of fear around like, um, you know, uh, investors coming in might take the company in a totally different direction than intended. Mm. Um, and I felt very protective of not just the team and the mission um, and the democratizing um kind of aspects of what we wanted to actually create with visual development and no code uh, tools to put them into a lot more hands than just like, you know, the people with the uh, largest pocketbooks or whatever, uh, or the, the largest businesses. Um, I, I did feel like a little bit of, uh, actually quite a lot of a fear around um, what growth at all costs might mean or what uh, an investor, not just guided, but investor forced set of decisions uh, might look like. Optimizing uh, for the short term versus exactly, exactly. So I was like very skeptical that even if you find, you know, somebody who says the right things um, behind the scenes, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pressure to like return capital and and um, and behave like I I saw through the the Web 2.0 days and uh, especially post reset post 2008, like there was some kind of sketchy uh, sketchy behavior, not just on like on companies' parts, right, to to like skirt around regulations and do you know not treat people well, et cetera. So I was um, I I always felt that um, I had this fear that if I if if we were overwhelmed by kind of investor input, um, even our own values wouldn't stand mm. up to like wouldn't able to keep that uh, sort of like pressure at bay, um, and. A lot of investor conversations kind of confirm that, you know, like throughout uh, in like 2015, 2016, as the business started to grow, more people started to reach out. But right. Uh, but for the most part, it kind of confirmed that story in my head. Like I would meet with investors and uh, they would um, kind of give me their own version of what their vision was. Right. Or um, like, why don't you go enterprise uh, you know, only serve enterprise customers. They they pay way more than self serve uh, kind of small freelancers or web designers might pay you. Um, and it just felt like off mission to me, mm. right? And um, it felt like very conditional. Like if they if they give you money, that they there's a lot of things that you need to change. Um, so I had that skepticism going in, um, but I think the uh, things really started. A I started to see that uh, we were really constrained. Uh, by what we like, how quickly we could like build new products, and uh, and mostly how quickly we could hire to build those new products, um, and that was very much like one person at a time, right? Like we make more revenue, we hire another person. We make more revenue, hire another person, um, and uh, I started to see how that is like way suboptimal to what we actually wanted to build, but we didn't have enough cash in the bank, right? Mm -hmm. It was sort of like our margin of error was tiny. I think we had like a $2 million buffer in on our balance sheet where, you know, so if you hire a team of 10, uh, that half of that is gone uh, within the first nine months, like if you factor in a typical developer salary. Uh, so that combined with actually meeting investors such as yourself and uh, Sh Shree from um, Silversmith was actually a huge contributor to this, like actually seeing how everything like, from first conversation to the second conversation to the third conversation was about the mission and the team and the values and like the future direction and what we as a team want to do. Um, and that was a uh, kind of a mental shift around like, oh, investors like that must exist. You know, that are they're actually uh, not in name, not partners in name only, um, but are actually like feel like partners to the mission, to the, to the business. and. Um, and then as we started, like, as we started talking, seeing how much 
um, you and um, and the Excel team like actually dive in to help companies that are like less mature figure out like the next steps, right? And to us, it just felt like a cheat code. Um, uh, I think you maybe I don't know how much um, your partners actually know this, how much time you actually spent. <laughs> uh, Almost being like a quasi team member, um, that was really, you know, really, really impressive to see. But but the thing that I was still skeptical around, like, hey, you can say one thing, like we can have a coffee and you can tell me um, all the right things to convince me that, uh, you know, uh, you're not like every other investor. Uh, but I think the thing that really tipped it over um, is when you suggested like the social contract. Um, and we really like put both of our values on paper um, to where we like talked it through like this is what actually this is what the partnership will look like over the next decade hopefully many decades um and like the a the fact that you suggested that b the fact that like i uh i felt that it was genuine and now i can confirm that it's been genuine for like you know going on almost five years now uh that really tipped the scales um uh, where, where I was like, look, the, the advantages of being able to not only grow faster, but with a partner that has a done this before, um, and uh, we'll have our backs as we go through something that we haven't gone through before. And by the way, at that time, we hadn't even hired a single executive yet, right? So the team right. was like really, uh, uh, by all objective measures in like VC land, pretty immature, right? As a as a team, even though our business was, uh, you know. Uh, thriving and uh, was seeing quite a lot of product market fit, et cetera. Um, it still felt like a massive bet, right? Uh, that um, I'm sure from your perspective, maybe it was like more of like a diamond in the rough, like an undiscovered yeah. gem potentially right. um, in that we weren't, you know, we weren't out there looking for investment. Uh, right. We, we were just, realize through our conversations that we can do so much more um, and expand our mission so much faster uh, if we had uh, more more uh, courage capital and like wind behind our sails. Well, well, two things that you said that really resonate with me. First, it was an aligning function on both sides, that mm -hmm. social contract that you're referring yeah. to. Because I think where relationships tend to not work out, it's where you have different expectations yep. going into it. Mm -hmm. And if you can at least be clear about what our intention yep. is, and you can be clear about what yep. your intention is, you can get those things out in the open really early. And so I've used that construct with yep. other companies awesome. to great success because it just forces that candid conversation from the very beginning. Yep. And thankfully, there was real alignment there. You know, everything that you laid out on paper, I really agreed with. Yep. Oftentimes, you get people and entrepreneurs that are focused on optimizing the short term rather than building mm -hmm. really a generational company and a long term focus. And sometimes that might mean short term compromises to achieve long term success. But you really have to have that mindset yep. from the very beginning. And our most successful founders have always had that. And that's what you said through and through in that document. So I thought that was really great. I actually love that. It reminds me of a. Um something an old coach of mine told me like uh un unclear expectations are premeditated resentments mm. um and and i think a lot of vc and company founder relationships they just don't have conversations about right. expectations right. right not even um not even about future upside uh which is easier uh but they definitely you know, it's less common to have expectations around the partnership, right? Like what right. what you expect of each other. But I think that also set the tonality for our relationship. I mean, even today, we had a very candid conversation about a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's always rooted in a foundation of trust and respect. Yep. But you can have very honest conversations, which are really important. As you're going through tough times, good times, yep. it's really important. Um, and I also think the other part that's important is that you had options. You had created a business that didn't need capital, that was profitable, mm -hmm. that was doing well, but it really was the opportunity about cap capturing the upside yep. and the potential for the business, mm -hmm. which we'll, we'll, we're about to get into. Yep. So, so post-investment, you raise a big round. It was a $75 million Series A or so. Um, 
which these days seems which, tiny. <laughs> exactly. In those days, <laughs> yeah. that was a big that was uh -huh. a big series A. Um, what changed? Take take us through the first eighteen months of what changed in the business. What mm -hmm. changed with you? How did your role evolve? Yep. In that period, I think the the next few years, up until almost to this point, honestly, has just been like this learning journey of how do you uh, scale the team, how do you build build up new leaders uh, that that you're leading through um, that are themselves a representation of the company mission, our core behaviors, our culture. Um, they're like the torchbearers for like why why we exist, why we need to be successful, why uh, what we do for our customers um, uh, and how the product works, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's not, it, I thought, you know, 10 years ago that the bigger you get, the more money you have in the bank, uh, the easier this stuff gets. That's by far not the case, right? <laughs> like every, uh, every kind of uh, scaling stage has its own, by the time you figure out how to fix something, like you grow enough that it, the solution is no longer relevant, right? And you have to like reinvent not just the way that you work, but um, for me especially, it was a lot of um, a lot of learning on how to uh, teach others what I know, mm -hmm. um, and doing that in a way that is not doesn't minimize other people's contributions, but also uh, doesn't lower the bar for um, how how deep we have to understand our customers and our products yeah. and our space. The hardest part has been like, how do you build the machine or the team that builds the machine or that builds the product? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I did not appreciate when we first started um, how much that is the job of a founder at this scale um, than just building a product, right? Building a product with a smaller team is, um, uh, it's possible, and many products have been built that way, Webflow included. But when you get to the scale of hundreds of thousands of customers and millions of uh, users, and uh, you know, uh, trillions of um, uh, site visits, and you know, people relying on your platform, that's a uh, it's a whole new ball game yeah. around like trying to figure out how you can like build up and foster the team and hire the team and invest into the team that can then take uh you know what we're building to greater heights what do you wish you had known mm -hmm. with clarity just the importance of go to market uh, i really did used to think that you know if you build it they will come um like oh if if uh uh you know growth is not what it needs to be just build the next feature uh and that'll solve everything right i really did used to think that way um but it really, um, in hindsight, I saw how much of our uh, product actually being landing in customers' hands um, and bringing, um, you know, the kind of impact that it has on the world. So much of that uh, impact has come from uh, the right people finding out about the product. And that's not through using the product. It's like through... Um, through like commercial conversations around like the value of like move like moving faster in your marketing org, right? Or getting the like the right buyer, not the user, uh, to be aware of your product um, and then become a champion of it. Um, I really didn't respect that as much as I respect it now. And and I think the the more uh, you know, I always heard the sayings like product is nothing, distribution is everything, but it didn't really like land. Um, I think there's a certain hubris to it. Or like, oh no, our product is is really good. And like people are just gonna uh, adopt it like hotcakes. Uh, but I, I wish I had spent a lot more time, including in year one, um, to really think about um, just a distribution and how like uh, like growth flywheels work, how uh, how you can like create systems and incentives for users um, and adopters to be become like your Salesforce or set of partners that that bring the product to more people. Um, I wish I had spent a lot more time there. The other thing, um, I, in hindsight, I wish we would have done a lot more and sooner uh, was thinking very systematically around monetization and pricing and packaging. Um, where it the first year when we first launched, we were like reluctantly charged for our product. I really did think that because I as a user wouldn't be willing to pay, uh, you know, twenty five bucks or whatever because I was 
kind of anchored to WordPress, which I could use for free. Um, I was like, well, if I'm not going to pay, nobody else is going to pay. So we're not going to charge. We're not going to charge until we have like the full platform of CMS, like visual development, uh, a bunch of other like animation tools. And maybe that's when we'll charge. Thankfully, YC like beat it into us that you have to charge. Like even if you think it's going to be a few people, um, uh, like you have to figure out how to um, like price fairly for uh, the value that you're bringing to the market. Um, but then we kind of like left it alone for like six years. We sort of like set it and uh, set it and forgot it. Uh, but I wish we we spend a lot more time thinking through. Okay, what is the like, the buying behavior going to be in the future? Because every single you know by delaying those conversations, it makes any changes that much harder. Because now you have a set of customers. You know, in our case, it was tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands that are uh, you know are used to a certain type of pricing or like you set a uh, type of model where they're uh, they're used to getting a certain amount of like capabilities for for free or whatever and it's really hard to change retroactively so i i wish we had spent a lot more time on that uh, the other the last thing i'll say is um um i think i if i was to go back in time i would spend a lot more time uh training leaders uh not trying to you know, be like in every single corner of the company, uh, but making sure that uh, leaders could represent exactly what's in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way you can really do that is to spend a lot of time with them and put them uh, in, um, make them accountable for that thing uh, and help them, uh, you know, uh, be as successful as you think you would be in that role yourself. Um, I think I um, delayed some of that work thinking that, you know, folks will figure it out with time. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no replacement to uh, like onboarding very quickly. And the, the last thing I'll add to that is, uh, if I was to go back in time, we do this now, but with every leader, you know, especially senior leaders, you kind of think, oh, it's kind of above their pay grade to have them go learn the product inside and out, right? Uh, or maybe they'll figure out how to do that later. They'll go through our like tutorials, um, and now I do this thing, like even, we, you know, we have a CFO joining um, in a few months. That person is going through the Webflow Masterclass, even though never a web designer, but it gives so much, uh, I don't feel bad at, about it anymore to like ask uh, for executives and leaders to spend time in the product because that makes them so much more empathetic to what our customers actually go through. Context. Uh, yeah. and. And it's so hard to come back to later. So now I'm like unapologetically like, hey, you take the first week yeah. doing just this because it's going to be too hard to come back to it later. You're going to be way too in the job yeah. uh, to uh, to make time for this. Um, uh, so like the how important it is for leaders, even if they're in different functions and they're not the buyer, to know the the broad surface area of the product and what it does for customers. Uh, it's irreplaceable. Like you just make better decisions. People understand. There's more. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. Give us a sense of where the web development, visual development market's going. The advent of AI and the mm -hmm. application of AI is probably going to be pretty yeah. relevant to our category. Yeah. And Webflow's place in it. Visual development is now. It went from kind of a fringe, like it'll never work. Uh, you know, it's it's not for real it's not for real use case, it's not for production, to now being just status quo, right? People just, we've proved, uh, not just us, but many others have proved that um, it's not toys anymore, right? Like there's real business value um, and cost savings to building for production in a visual way. It's just, and it's way more intuitive. Uh, it's democratizing in the sense that so many more people can, can learn it much quicker than learning how to code. Um, the hard parts are still in figuring out what to build, right? Just like, um, and I think this is where AI is super helpful um, in assisting, uh, but it's not, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's like completely revolutionary um, in terms of like replacing the need for web designers or, or web developers. Uh, just like, uh, you know, GitHub Copilot um, revealed yeah, you can really speed up how, how fast developers work. That's not the hard part. The hard part is not writing the code. The hard part is like figuring out what to build, right? And like linking it all together. And the same thing in, in web design. Yeah, there's like a lot of um, disruption happening on the very low end, where if somebody was previously picking a template um, and like editing some content, 
maybe today um, AI can like do the vast majority of that, right? So it's like a, a faster starting point that's a little bit more customized. Um, but the uh, when it comes to the types of sites and applications that are built in, with Webflow, there's so much complexity um, that um, we see AI as like this, uh, just like GitHub Copilot. It's like a way to give the the builders who are in it every day uh, like superpowers that just makes them go faster. Um, and in some cases, it it will um, mean that uh, you know more can be done by a single person than what previously took two people. That's what an entire platform is about, right? Like in Webflow today, you can have one brand designer uh, who learns uh, the platform, run circles around you know, two designers and three developers five years ago um, and get more uh, out into the web with like sometimes deeper fidelity and customization uh, than, than what a design and engineering team might be able to do. Um, so the same way that visual development like really put a lot more um, uh, superpowers into the hands of like these non-coders, um, but gave them like coding superpowers, AI just like multiplies that. The thing that has been a little bit of a headwind for us though is like, we are customers initially like when this llm uh when chat gpt came out there was like this big uh kind of rush to okay how can we leverage our data to to power some of these like ai driven um uh kind of uh, tools and outcomes in in a tool in a tool like webflow but our our user base is like their entire living is uh, uh, like they are service providers, they are like brand designers, they're marketing teams, that their entire living comes from uh, what they build in Webflow. So we couldn't um, on principle say, hey, we're gonna go train on all of these people's, uh, on all of our customers' uh, data set. So we had to figure out a way to um, uh, train um, and create our co-pilot tools, which were in the process of getting to market uh, in a way that doesn't touch um, that essentially doesn't give our customers the the feeling that hey why am I creating you know templates and uh, like libraries and uh, components for your marketplaces when it's actually just going to be used to uh, train something that kind of replaces me uh, as a as a creative professional um, and we just decided on principle that uh, a you don't get enough value from uh, basically duplicating somebody like. Uh, repeating somebody else's template. It just looks templatized. Um, and we decided to focus our efforts on like essentially partial assisting where we're not trying to replace the entire, right. uh, you know, freelancer web designer, uh, knowing how much of their value comes from um, really understanding a customer problem, the story that they want to tell, and then building like the narrative and the story and the design and the implementation um, uh, through, through our platform. So it's, uh, you know, it's been transformational in the sense that so many of our customers can be more effective and efficient, uh, not just in Webflow, but like with content generation, et cetera. But we're seeing a little bit of a swing back to uh, the artisanal parts of the web where there's like a blowback to auto-generated content, you know, uh, more focus on, uh, you know, the, the art and science of delivering great uh, digital mm -hmm. experiences to uh, to customers to like convince them to buy your product or whatever. Uh, so it's it's like not revolutionary to the degree that sometimes it's uh, stated where it like changes everything, but it definitely is a um, uh, in my view a huge assist to um, helping these professionals be way more effective um, and. You know, the hope is that the there's some prognostications around nobody's going to be browsing the web five years from now. Everything is just going to be like a conversation. Uh, you know, I, I happen to believe in like the creativity of um, like there's there's an art to uh, connecting with customers uh, that I don't think will ever be replaced by this purely transactional like yeah. text based thing. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of upside still to like visual development and web design. Um, and uh, and it's like the thing that's most encouraging to me and most motivating to me is that the web itself, like literally half of the world, roughly half of the world isn't even participating on the web, not even like creating, but even consuming, right? So many people are not even uh, on the web. So the way that- um, We're still early days. Still early days. I mean, 
it's kind of a cliche saying it's day one or whatever, but for, may, for many, many countries, for many different people, they have not even scratched the surface of discovering what, what they can do on the web. Um, so it's a, um, maybe there's a world where uh, we fundamentally change how people interact with the web. I think maybe that's a couple of decades away. Yeah, so that's, a, that's away. a problem for a different day or an opportunity for a different day. Well, that seems like a pretty good spot to, to end it. Thanks for taking the time, Vlad. This is super, of course, it's my pleasure. Super, super great. Really appreciate it. 